Thank you, Sid. Uh, good evening. Uh, and as Sid said, welcome to Yale and U.S. College, both for those of you here in Tanjan Tuan and to those of you watching online. It is a great pleasure to have you all. And it is my pleasure to introduce this year's, our annual Global Affairs Lecture. Every year, we are able to bring leading voices on some of the most critical topics of the day, the breakdown or the renewal of democracy, global inequality, to mention some topics from recent years. And we are able to do this thanks to the vision of the late Professor Saswi Hawk, and we are grateful to his family for continuing his legacy. This year, we are delighted to welcome Professor Samuel Moyne. Professor Moyne is Chancellor Ken Professor of Law and History at Yale University, where he teaches courses on constitutionalism, international human rights, constitutional law, conservatism, among others. Professor Moyne is the author of numerous important works in the fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, including The Last Utopia, Human Rights and History, Christian Human Rights, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, Humane, How the, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, and most recently, his book, Liberalism Against Itself, Cold War Intellectuals and the Making of Our Times. Professor Moyne is also what is known as a public intellectual, and he is a frequent contributor to publications such as The New Republic, The New York Times, Dissent, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Wall Street Journal. He holds a PhD in Modern European History from Berkeley and a law degree from Harvard. Tonight, he will be talking to us about saving liberalism, from, saving liberalism from crisis, a topic that he has explored extensively and continues to work on. And of course, it could not be more topical. So I hope by the end of the evening, we will have some clarity on how to do that, on how to save liberalism from crisis. And I would also like to introduce my colleague, Professor Ben Shookman. He will moderate tonight's conversation. Professor Shopman is Assistant Professor in the Social Sciences, um, PPE, and he specializes in political theory and the history of political thought. His upcoming book is Democracy Despite Itself, Liberal Constitutionalism and Militant Democracy. It will be published in May by Oxford University Press, and it's a book that was partially written at Yale while he was there on um, as, a, as a visitor, and where he had the good idea to invite Professor Moyen to deliver this year's Global Affairs Lecture. So we're in for a great discussion, and I'm looking forward to it. So now, please join me in welcoming Professor Moyen, and let me ask you to come to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you to Ben in advance for Moderating, thanks above all to people for showing up tonight. I'm aware Taylor Swift is in town. Uh, this will not be as good, uh, but hopefully we can have an interesting discussion. So I'm going to talk about a debate that's been a fixture of transatlantic discussion for about the past uh, five years uh, since Donald Trump was elected and even before that, uh, since the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom. These events blindsided self-styled liberals, uh, and they've responded with confusion and panic. And some of them have rued the end of something called liberalism, like the Financial Times a correspondent, Edward Luce, who wrote the book, The Retreat of Western Liberalism. More portentously, some have welcomed something called the crisis of liberalism, the reactionary right-wing intellectual, uh, Patrick Deneen published a book in 2018 called Why Liberalism Failed. And it achieved enormous notice, especially in the United States, uh, including, as you see, from the former President Barack Obama. Why were people so focused on this alleged crisis? Well, it seems clear that after these shocking events of 2016, liberals were afraid. They wondered if they had gone wrong. And 
uh, though their general response to the era of Trump uh, and the era of populism generally has been to attack him and it and those voters who support Trump and populism for ruining everything, uh, their preoccupation with authors like Deneen shows that at a deeper level, liberals are in a period of existential doubt about the viability of liberalism itself. So my plan for today is to talk just about the terms of this debate since 2016, what it was about, what its participants thought it was about, and what I think a better way of framing the problem is. Now, I'm going to be very parochial. I've already said this is a transatlantic debate, and I'm going to be focusing uh, as an American on Deneen and some ways of thinking beyond his understanding. But obviously, I'm not in the United States. Uh, and yet, I think every place is both specific and has universal ramifications. And so hopefully, we'll find some things about the crisis of liberalism as discussed in my country and across the Atlantic that are of general applicability. Regardless, it's clear that 2016 is in a sense not over. Only a couple of days ago, it's been confirmed in the so-called Super Tuesday event that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee. He's bested uh, all of his rivals and it seems as if he has some strengths that have yet to be fully uh, understood. Uh, and this provides a second reason for concerning ourselves with the debate among liberals uh, that Trump unleashed, since after all, who, uh, who becomes the president of the United States matters everywhere. So the way I'll proceed in my time is just to say a few words about what this debate about liberalism was since 2016, what its terms were, how people define liberalism, what people said was wrong with it or right about it. And then I'll step back to um, think about uh, the problem from a different perspective that of intellectual history. How should we, having studied figures like John Locke and John Stuart Mill, Ben assured me you've read those uh, individuals, think about this debate with a little more perspective. And then I'll introduce my own ideas, which have to do with Cold War liberalism. I'm going to argue that liberalism changed a lot around the middle of the 20th century, and that's why there's a crisis of liberalism today. And then I'll conclude, and we'll have a, our discussion. So starting with Deneen, uh, in case you haven't heard of him, um, although he's become very well known. Uh, he's a conservative Roman Catholic intellectual who teaches at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and I wouldn't say that many of his arguments about liberalism and what's wrong with it were original, but he had a genius for timing uh, or just good luck because he said liberalism was over just at the time many people wondered if it actually was. Now, what did he mean by liberalism? So here he adopted a, a familiar view. It might be right. Uh, it's from the right wing. Uh, and it goes like this. Liberalism uh, began as a po the political philosophy of modernity. It is 500 years old. Uh, more or less, from the era of a, the Renaissance and especially of the Reformation, and arose on the ruins of medieval Christendom. For tonight, I would say we could take as its most representative figure in Deneen's understanding, Locke, the 17th century Englishman. So on this view of what liberalism is about, it's just modernity individualism and secularism that go with modern approaches. Where pre-modern thought in the West, classical thought, Christian thought, said there's a highest life for human being, a summum bonum. Uh, 
modern civilization in this view, liberal frameworks are about unleashing people from any highest life to choose their own. And that's a recipe, not just for individualism, but relativism. It isolates human beings from community uh, and leaves them alone or even narcissistic. Uh, now, one of the edgier aspects of Deneen's theory in this regard was that he was quite willing to see an economic component to the crisis of liberalism, since one way in which we can be individualistic is by seeking uh, uh, as much money as we can and spending it for our own individual self-fulfillment. And so in an almost Marxist way, Deneen was willing to sweep into his indictment of liberalism, the modern capitalist and neoliberal economy. But unlike leftists who have indicted those things in the name of modern emancipation, uh, Deneen thought that uh, what we think of as gilded age consumerism, hedonism, inequality of class, they're really symptoms of this modern break uh, towards uh, relativism and secularism. And if that was true, then progressives uh, were not up to the challenge. In a sense, they were going to be part of the problem. Uh, in a way, progressives uh, might be proposing to intensify the causes of liberal breakdown. Now, there were some responses uh, to Deneen, actually a lot from pretty well-known journalists and public figures, probably the best known of whom would be Francis Fukuyama. To me, the striking thing about all of those early responses in the first five years or so after 2016 is that uh, they actually worked in an interesting way within Deneen's framework, especially chronologically. They agreed that modernity is about 500 years old. It's about unleashing individuals. Uh, it's connected to capitalism. Uh, they just all said that it's a good thing or, or that it should be you know, treated less harshly than Deneen was willing to treat it. Uh, and so they took what we could call in technical terms an apologetic attitude. Uh, they said liberalism deserves to be sheltered. Uh, maybe there are a few problems uh, like Adam Gopnik, the New Yorker journalist in his response said we should you know, maybe not be as neoliberal uh, as we have been lately. Fukuyama in his entry said we shouldn't be as woke as the left has been lately. But they all argued that lock and capitalism are things that we should embrace and celebrate as uh, what liberals stand for. Most interestingly, I think, the debate as it's taken place so far has consisted in something like an up and up or down vote on liberalism, which you either have to take or leave. Uh, we just have to choose sides. And the nature of the debate about it is really about choosing whether you are going to stick with it or break in some radical way, as Deneen suggested in hankering for the Middle Ages and the metaphysical plenitude that he said liberalism is about uh, losing. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna um, contrast that debate with what historians have been saying about liberalism because it's really very different. Uh, you could say the public debate of those journalists and intellectuals who consented to work within Patrick Deneen's chronology of a 500-year-old liberalism 
uh, and something that you had to take or leave was really out of touch with the way a different group of people, less famous, selling fewer books, but possibly better informed, have been uh, talking about liberalism. And I've put some of those people's books on the slide if you want to you know, pursue the details. According to current views in this approach, liberalism is not as old as Deneen and his critics both assumed. Rather, it was born when there came to be people who actually called themselves liberal. And that was only in the 19th century, in the 1820s, specifically in Spain first, and then uh, and then France. Uh, and contrary then to Denis's narrative and those of his critics, it really wasn't an Anglophone uh, movement, a transatlantic movement first and foremost. It might have become so later. It didn't go from John Locke in the 17th century to John Rawls. It was first and foremost a continental European invention. So the geography of this approach differs too. But most of all, I think it's the content of the view about what liberalism is that matters in what the historians and historians of political thought have had to contribute. Uh, so in this view, liberalism wasn't really just about individual freedom against the community and against the state, uh, especially not for the sake of getting and spending. Rather, uh, liberalism was about uh, uh, responding to the French Revolution, which came immediately before the founding of liberalism as the self-styled movement in the 1820s. And the French Revolution, according to these liberals, had gone wrong. Part of the reason is that it was attacked by all the powers of Europe. Uh, but also, there may have been just great difficulties in getting modern freedom and equality, which the French Revolution uh, tried to launch as a political project durable and stable. And these liberals then adopted the project of uh, saving the French Revolution's bequest to modern times, which is a collective quest to institutionalize freedom and equality for a, a new age. Now, if that's all true, a, a lot of consequences follows, because if that's how we should think about liberalism, not just chronologically and geographically, but in its substance, then it suggests that Dean Lean and his critics were wrong. Liberalism is not just about the emancipation of the, of the individual from all that surrounds him or her, especially other people in community or the state and its power. It's not principally about uh, the individual's property and its protection, which you'll remember John Locke did write about. Rather, it's about uh, this collective project of discovering how to make a free community of equals real in uh, the with the proper mix of public and private institutions. Now, it's interesting, this way of thinking, just if you're interested in methodology, is interested in the history of words, like when did people say they were liberal? And that may not be the perfect way of studying everything, but it's very useful to at least get our intuitions uh, clearer. It's worth noting, if you're interested, that in my country, the United States, there were no people calling themselves liberals until very late, 
As you may know, in Germany and later in England, there were liberal parties uh, in the later 19th century and after. In America, there weren't people who called themselves liberals until after World War I in large numbers. So Benin is talking about a crisis that's 500 years old and leading to Donald Trump when there had barely been liberals in existence in that country uh, for uh, a, a century. So um, what I wanna suggest now is that we um, think about a big break uh, in the history of liberalism. As, as these historians have presented it, liberalism is in a word about emancipation. It is, uh, ha it does have some of the features that Deneen suggested really come from before, getting rid of millenniums of hierarchy, dismantling feudal structures, uh, creating greater opportunities for economic as well as social mobility, at least for men until very recently, breaking down barriers based on religion and tradition, even if we now can see so clearly that that 19th century liberal goal was connected with imperialism and racism too. Uh, but it wasn't exactly the way Deneen presented it because liberals understood that uh, emancipation would have collective features and it might require the state to create the conditions in which we can become free and equal. So what happened after that, I think, is uh, something of a, a, a change of mind among liberals. Uh, there's no doubt that for this period of the 19th century, liberals thought the market could do a lot of the work of emancipation, maybe more than some people might think now. And actually, Deneen is not the only one. I agree with him that we can overstate the emancipating of virtues of the market, given how it creates new hierarchies. Uh, and, uh, and yet, what is so significant about this 19th century tradition, uh, unlike the thought of John Locke, is two features, two ways of giving content to the emancipationist uh, goals of liberalism. Let's call the first perfectionism. Now, I mentioned before that Deneen said it was only pre-moderns who believed in a highest life for human beings, and moderns ditched that in favor of relativism. Uh, but actually, liberals believed in the highest life in the 19th century. They said, we should want to be new kinds of people Liberalism isn't about protecting your freedom and private. It's about creating a new public culture in which we all can become free and exercise our freedom in creative ways. And they were very clear that this was a substitute for the highest good or the summum bonum that a Plato and Aristotle and uh, religious traditions had thought of in conformist ways. They said, what if we swap out creativity as what we're here to do in our lives? Uh, and if that's true, then it's wrong to say that modernity is about abandoning a high end for ourselves. Liberals wanted to propagate such a thing. And then they were progressivist. Uh, by that, I just mean they thought uh, freedom and equality can't be built in a day, especially when the French Revolution failed and we have to find the right institutions for living together in a free community of equal. And if that's true, then liberalism is a historical project that will have to be thought of as uh, existing in between a past in which fewer were free and equal 
and a future in which more people will be freer in more ways than before. Finally, it's really interesting that liberals, uh, in spite of their general commitment to laissez-faire before the 20th century, began to learn a lot from Marxism, which challenged them on this very point. And where Karl Marx had said that uh, uh, freedom, if it's just defined formally, isn't real, liberals agreed. And there began to be liberals known in England as new liberals and in the United States as progressives who said, we have to contain the economic freedom of the rich precisely for the sake of the freedom and equality of everyone else. And that was a, a brilliant instance of learning from an enemy. Now, liberals had enemies and they were aware that especially because things can go wrong in history and freedom and equality aren't built in a day, they could lose sometimes, lose elections, lose whole countries. Uh, but they took, I think, a view that is of, of really exceptional importance in our own time about these uh, possibilities. They said, we're not Pollyannish. We're not unaware that there's risk in politics, that the wrong side can win, but we can't let ourselves be paralyzed. Uh, the great figure in this regard, Ben's assured me that you've also read him, is Alexis de Tocqueville, who spoke of salutary fear, which keeps us attentive to the risks, but also the risks we incur when we have too much fear and give into it and give up a liberal mission of institutionalizing freedom and equality over time. So just before the uh, moving on, I'd just mention, since you've read it, that John Stuart Mill epitomizes everything I've said uh, in this lecture about what liberalism was before our time and before the Cold War in particular. Uh, he's most famous for the book you probably were assigned on liberty. Uh, and in the 20th century, when John Locke was made a liberal retroactively, even though he never called himself one, Mill was also taught in a libertarian spirit. And of course it's true, look at the chapter titles, a lot of his book is about the limitation of state power over individual conduct. Uh, and so uh, it, it, his first chapter in the book is an indispensable primer on why it is we should have freedom of thought and discussion. But most important to place Mill in the liberal tradition I think, is the next chapter, which is about why we should think of freedom not as an end in itself, freedom against the state, but in instrumental terms. It serves as an individual and social good, which is the production of novelty, because for Mill, the highest life is creativity, or in his term, individuality. Uh, and so, uh, he's a great example of a perfectionist liberal in the terms I had developed just before. He also believed in a progressivist liberalism because he understood that the project of freedom and equality is always in between its beginnings and its fulfillment. Well, then disaster struck. So uh, I think liberals forgot many of their founding principles and it, this is why it's so important to get the timing of the inception of liberalism, right? Because it turns out that we read books that are too old, like John Locke, uh, and don't focus on the inception of liberalism. Now, in my own book, uh, Liberalism Against Itself, I've uh, suggested that the middle of the 20th century, because they were such trying times for, for liberals, 
led those who claim the name liberal, some of whom are on the slide, uh, to abandon some of the central tenets. Uh, and not accidentally, it was at this time that John Locke was retroactively made a liberal. Uh, the transatlantic space where English was spoken was seen as liberalism's homeland, uh, leaving continental Europe uh, marginal. Uh, and central ideas uh, were uh, expunged from what it meant to be a liberal. Now, clearly things were going badly. It was a time to be depressed in the middle of the 20th century. The Weimar Republic collapsed, fascism rose. Uh, many of the central Cold War liberals, everyone on that slide was from a Jewish background. So you might think they had special reasons given the collapse of uh, freedom in their time and the death of millions that followed to think that maybe we need to rethink our principles or abandon liberalism all together. Um, I think they overreacted. Uh, but what they began to say is that liberals should not overpromise. They shouldn't think of liberalism as about the institutionalization, including through state power, of freedom and equality for a few different reasons. First, they were living in an era of the hypertrophy of the state. Uh, and they said, someone needs to mark its limits finally. Where the 19th century liberals had begged for more state in the absence of an interventionist state, the liberal problem in the middle of the 20th century is these people saw it as the opposite. Too much state, freedom against it needs to be made the mantra. Uh, but then I think they went further and said, 19th century liberalism with its ambitious promises of a freedom to come, it makes liberals sound too much like the Soviet Union, which itself claimed to be institutionalizing freedom and equality, itself promised a bright future for humanity. And so the liberals of the Cold War said, maybe we should stop doing those things. The worst thing they thought was that a lot of well-meaning uh, liberals were getting confused by the Soviets and throwing in their lot with communism because they couldn't tell the difference. And it would be simpler if liberals stood for something very different, not emancipation, but freedom against the state. The classic example of that kind of argument comes in Isaiah Berlin's uh, famous lecture. I don't know if that's still assigned. It's called uh, Two Concepts of Liberty. Uh, now, these liberals also indicted the idea of progress, the historical fulfillment of freedom and equality, because they said, the Soviets are showing it's an alibi for great crime, and it, it was. Um, but it was very fateful that liberals gave it up. Okay, so what uh, are the, the, the consequences of this? I think there was a big difference, even though liberals for a time continued to build welfare states across the Atlantic between the spirit in which they presented liberalism and uh, their immediate predecessors, the last of the 19th century liberals. I'm taking the example of Franklin Roosevelt as the last of those 19th century or new liberals uh, who said, we can't just defend freedom against the state. We have to reinvent the state so it keeps its promises finally. And this is so relevant to today when uh, there's just an enormous discourse about saving democracy without clear thinking 
the, the kind that Roosevelt demanded about, well, what kind of democracy? Should it keep its promises? Should it be made appealing and credible to more people? That's what Roosevelt struggled to achieve. Also interesting is Roosevelt's attitude towards fear, which unlike Tocqueville, who at least said we should cultivate a, a kind of salutary fear about risks and setbacks and reversals, Roosevelt said we should be courageous and deny fear altogether. So uh, th this was a, 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 a very different approach than the Cold War liberals brought. Uh, Judith Schwar, one of the characters I talk about in my book, and I believe Ben said he's assigned uh, her famous essay in this regard, called liberalism a liberalism of fear because its whole purpose is to keep fear at bay, especially fear of the bodily injury that states so often inflict. That was not Roosevelt's view. It wasn't the view of 19th century liberals, but it became hegemonic due to Cold War liberals. Now, before I conclude, I'm just going to make a couple of points about um, the relation of theory and practice, just to because we need to keep those stories separate uh, and connected at the same time. I've said after World War II, the Cold War liberals became libertarians. Uh, they defined freedom against the state as the central plank of liberalism. For a while though, in practice, liberal politicians were building, even perfecting in some places, welfare states the biggest most interventionist, most redistributive states. Uh, and this is a really important fact, which we could talk more about later. What's interesting is that liberal theory moves first. And there's this mismatch for the first few decades after World War II and the North Atlantic between what liberals are saying liberalism is about and what their politicians are trying to achieve. Uh, and then there's a second mismatch, which comes in our time. Actually, if you're concerned about the history of political thought, uh, uh, the, that last liberal we talked about, John Rawls, a Harvard philosopher, made liberalism much more egalitarian and proposed vast redistribution. But it was at the very moment that in practice, liberals shifted away from welfare states towards economic freedom and neoliberalism. So there's just this interesting fact I think we should ponder that the history of liberalism for about the last century is the history of two big mismatches. Okay, so I need to conclude. So um, I, I'm going to say a couple of things in conclusion. Mainly I've argued that Cold War liberalism was disastrous by cutting us off from the prior uh, parts of the liberal tradition uh, that the real liberal tradition of the 19th century. Uh, and I want to conclude with what some of the consequences are. I won't have time to talk about uh, liberal foreign policy, but um, maybe we don't see a lot of liberalism ever in liberal foreign policy, um, since uh, it seems like we should look at the history of liberalism at, at, in the domestic setting uh, to think about when it's actually been liberal in its theory and practice uh, and what's happening uh, today. But it's only fair to note that one big dimension of the crisis of liberalism today is about the so-called rules-based international order and the threat of a new Cold War, which Americans and the West generally have been declaring in the past few years. So maybe we should come back to that because it seems I think unnerving to many of us that in response to the crisis of liberalism, far from seeking its roots in the Cold War, many liberals are declaring a new Cold War, uh, which seems uh, paradoxical or at least interesting. But I really want to conclude with you know some thinking about um, how liberals have been responding to 
this crisis since 2016 domestically and the relevance of my alternative story to it. As you probably know, Joe Biden has tried to get back to Franklin Roosevelt's tradition and said we need to uh, spend a little bit more, treat the state as an opportunity and not just a threat in the Cold War or libertarian manner. But I would say, looking at the character of public debate about the fate of liberalism in the era of Trump, as you've seen on this slide, according to current polls, Trump is likeliest to win as of today, uh, though there's time. Uh, liberals have been doubling down on Cold War fear. Their watchword in response to Trump has been, we must save democracy from tyranny, freedom from its enemies. They have not committed to reinventing liberalism to be credible to more voters. Uh, they have not said liberalism needs to offer something old or new for people to believe in and find appealing and uplifting in order to survive this era of crisis. Now, I've argued two things about why they might want to change their tune if in the time allowed before November 2024. First, I've argued liberals once offered something to believe in. That was their main bequest uh, to world history was to be the first, although not necessarily the last, philosophy of human emancipation. They weren't obsessed by enemies in their origins. Liberals uh, held out hope for uh, freedom and equality and uh, what Mill called experiments in living and sought the institutions to make those available to more people in more ways. But you don't find liberals today with ambitious projects, dreaming big, saying they will bring about a future that will uh, be fulfilling to people who are rejecting their politics. More important, I've suggested liberalism is not take it or leave it. Uh, I've said there was one big change in the tradition, but regardless, we can't keep going on with a debate in which liberalism is 500 years old. It's one thing to take or leave. It turns out there are different liberal tendencies, different liberals, Liberals are at war with one another over what liberalism is and ought to be. And if that's true, then we need to take threats like Donald Trump as an opportunity to hold up a mirror to ourselves if we're liberals and decide who have we been? What are the alternatives in our tradition, some of which we can revive, some of which we can reject? And in order to make something new. And if that happens, I think there will be a better chance than the approaches we've seen so far to surviving this ongoing era uh, that Donald Trump uh, has defined, not just in my country, but uh, really around the world. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'll, be, I'll be moderating this event and what I'd like to do is is take questions from the audience, and I, I think we'll also be taking questions from Zoom. Um, so if if you have a question for Professor Moyne, please raise your hand so that I can see it. Um, in order to get things going, though, and give give those some of you a chance to digest this and, and maybe think about your question a little bit, I'll ask a quick question, and you're welcome to spend as much or as little time with it as you'd like. Um, so first of all, let, let me say thank you for coming and thank you for talking about your book. It was, I, I read the book, it's phenomenal. I learned a lot and it challenged, I consider myself a liberal. It challenged a lot of my beliefs and got me to, to critically reconsider them. Um, 
in the book, as you mentioned in your talk, uh, liberalism, it, it has merits, it has potential, but it seems to be failing. Why is it failing? It's failing because Cold War liberalism, um, it's fearful. It seems to have no vision. Um, you didn't use this word, but maybe it's fair to say that it's hopeless. And um, one thing you mentioned in the book, and you only alluded to in the talk, is that it's obsessed with defending liberal essentials in that, that sort of negative Berlinian sense. So what do we do? And your argument is we should turn back to the 19th century and think about um, ways in which we can reinvent it. You focus on progressivism and perfectionism. I, I agree with you that uh, liberalism can be more ambitious and it should be hopeful. Um, but, and, and this is this is my question now, at least as I understood it from your talk and from reading the book, you seem to present us with a, a dichotomy, two options, an either or. Either we can be like the Cold War liberals and we can focus on the sort of fearful um, rear guard defense of liberal essentials, or we can be progressive. And uh, as was clear in your talk, part of that includes a more robust uh, state, in particular, a more wel robust welfare state. My question to you is, why can't we do both? Why can't we defend liberal essentials and as liberals advocate a more hopeful vision of that along with a more robust state? Why might we wanna do both? So in your talk you alluded to, or, or you actually said 2016 isn't over. And at least it looks like right now, for example, in the United States, a uh, illiberal, arguably anti-Democrat, maybe the next president again. Um, most studies that measure liberalism and democracy have shown that they've been in decline for 20 years around the world or almost 20 years around the world. Um, so there seem to be good reasons to try to defend liberal essentials. And insofar as due process, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, et cetera, all of these freedom of the press, all these liberal constitutional essentials are important. Shouldn't we want them to remain a part of the democratic order? Perhaps as preconditions for that summum bonum that um, 19th century or earlier liberals would have advocated. So my question is, why can't liberals have their cake and eat it? That is defend liberal essentials and advocate for a more hopeful vision of the welfare state. Or to put it a little bit differently, should we just be reading more John Rawls? Okay, so um, great question, Ben. Um, so I, I wouldn't put it exa exactly the way you did. And if I put it differently, then I get out of the challenge. So I, don't, I wouldn't say that the first batch of liberals and the second are, you know, are offering totally opposite views uh, because the people who offered both a, a vision of what you're calling liberal essentials and place them in a more ambitious and visionary package were the first group. So Mill is not abandoning freedom of speech in the name of something higher. He's justifying it on the grounds of a, a collective embrace of that higher commitment to individuality. Um, and so then it looks like the, the Cold War liberals um, in a sense, winnowed things out that the earlier liberals cared about since every liberal cares about limits to the state. I mean, that does seem pretty important to be a liberal. That's gonna be part of the mix. The question is whether that's it uh, and whether you you know turn a, a blind eye to these other concerns. I would say if we look at the present, um, we, we find that it is possible to beat the enemies of liberalism, uh, but it, it's generally done, you know, electorally. So Bolsonaro in Brazil lost, uh, the Law and Justice Party in Poland lost. Uh, and that's not to say that, you know, the way we save democracy is just practice democracy, but it seems like that it is is maybe you know 
the the most the, the likeliest way of doing so. Uh, Ben's written a brilliant forthcoming book on some other ways uh, we could do so, um, and maybe those are worth uh, considering. But it, it would only be within this larger package uh, of liberal goods and within a more kind of ambitious set of aspirations. Okay. Um, who has questions in the audience? Uh, why don't we start with, with Xiao and and as Sam speaking, if those of you who still have questions could put your hands up, that'd be great. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Xiao. Thank, thank you, Professor Moy, for coming all the way to Singapore to give us this speech. It was, it was very good. Um, so I don't want to be faced by saying I haven't finished reading your book. Um, so if your honest answer to my question is read the book, I, I it's valid. Like I will read it. <laughs> It'd be rude um, to say that. <laughs> so, but um, but um, so, yeah. So you mentioned in your lecture that um, the nineteenth century liberals had both sort of the traditional Lockean libertarian elements as well as the more progressive elements. So uh, my question is, when doing your research for the book, how did you come to the conclusion that it was the latter that was really the heart? of liberalism? Was it just based upon those yes. other historians' assessments or was it something yes. else? Yes. So, you know, when, when you're comparing different things, your inevitable temptation will be to accentuate the differences. Uh, the things that, you know, that groups share might be, you know, of less interest. Um, and maybe really both of your questions suggest that we, we shouldn't give in to that temptation and make sure to register similarities and differences because it's of the utmost importance that early liberals uh, cared about freedom and limits to the state, uh, not just uh, a bright future for humanity and emancipation so that people can live creative lives. So um, I would still, you know, wonder if it's defensible to kind of accentuate what uh, liberals once had that was expunged because we might need it back. Uh, no one needs anyone to argue that we still need liberals to value free speech because they already do um, up to a point. Um, so uh, that was my, let's say, that was my reason for um, uh, uh, an emphasis both in the talk and actually in the book on what the Cold War liberals um, kind of left behind uh, and what we might then need to retrieve. In in the back, sorry, I, I, I don't think I know your name, but Rosef. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Moin. Uh, you're actually one of the best I cited on my undergrad capstone. Uh, anyway, so my question is, uh, do you think when it comes to, I know you didn't talk about foreign policy, yeah. I'm just wondering about your views on liberalism and foreign policy. Okay. But do you think in, during the Cold War, there is a kind of contradiction? So on one hand, as you said, uh, liberals have this fear of, of the state and voting against individual freedom or individual rights. But yeah. do you think uh, that in terms of foreign policy, it's actually the opposite that liberals would use the state as a yes. machine to defend uh, individual rights in other places. I also know in your other book, The Last Utopia, uh, you argued some, something along the lines, I apologize if I'm using the correct terminology here, or the incorrect terminology, but you said that after the Jimmy Carter administration, that human rights is seen as something that supersedes uh, sovereign, sovereignty, that it is used as an institution that defends human rights against the state, which is kind of in line with what both yeah. like Cold War liberals think, but do you think that people have used that kind of line of thinking to use the state to intervene in places uh, abroad in defense of human rights? Good. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that question because it allows me to say a few words about so-called liberal internationalism. Um, you know, there's, there's an old, you know, saying about the Holy Roman Empire that it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Uh, and that's basically what I think about liberal internationalism. Um, 
the foreign policy of liberals historically has not been very liberal and it's not advanced internationalism in, in the form of peace um, in many episodes. The first great liberal power was the United Kingdom. And like, what was it doing in this region of the world? It was advancing free trade, but with a lot of guns and, you know, empire, where did Singapore come from? Um, and America succeeded the, the British empire as the great world power. I'm not going to say it never promoted freedom, uh, but it was a, the second free trade power. Um, and that's in large part what the, what the Cold War was actually about. Um, and then, as you say, once the Cold War was over, um, liberals continued having a lot of wars. Sometimes they were in the name of freedom from the state. But, um, you know, we, we, it's hard to look back at some of these wars and say freedom was actually advanced through force of arms. So although I, I'm, I, I'm not sure it's like, you know, the, the fate of liberalism in the United States, which is my main topic today, depends on, you know, what, whether liberals change their tune and, and come up with a, a liberal foreign policy someday. I think they should. Uh, if I can cite another great, you know, uh, thinker, it, it would be Mohandas Gandhi, who was once asked what he thought of Western civil. That it sounds like it would be a good idea. A, a rules based international order, like let's build one. Other questions? Yeah, again, I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name. Hi, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that, like, oh, I'm Dominic Phillips. I'm an exchange student from the U. Uh, I'm American, uh, okay. and I go to school yeah. in Korea, and I'm on exchange here right now. Um, so my question was, you mentioned that Biden is kind of bringing back sort of like a Roosevelt yeah. style of policy. Yes. But I do think there's like a big gap between maybe the actual accomplishments and the like macroeconomic numbers and the perception of the economy and like the accomplishments of the administration. Correct. So if like, you know, for example, the economy is doing like, like the numbers say it's okay, but people don't feel it. Is it possible for people who are, would consider themselves to be liberals to change the messaging and perceptions fast enough? Like, what do you think about the prospects of that? Thank you. It's a great question. And, it, you know, you or others may know more to say, formulate an answer than I do, but I'll, I guess I'll comment that we wouldn't want to, you know, get too celebratory about how far Biden has broken with the, the, the tradition of prior Democrats for about 50 years, which was more neoliberal than liberal. Um, of course, it's true that under the pressure of seeing Trump win, uh, the Democrats have changed um, to an extent and they've passed some big spending. Um, it, it, you know, like at the very center of the kind of like anxiety about Trump's success in the polls and Biden's sheer unpopularity, which may just follow mainly from how old he is, is the fact that it doesn't seem like um, the largesse of the federal government is changing people's political um, preferences. And a lot of people are indeed puzzled by this. So, you know, one, you know, one theory has to do with like, you know, the, the time it takes to, uh, you know, for people to have their material conditions experienced differently enough that their ideological views change. I would say, Biden hasn't done a lot of bragging about those achievements or, you know, promised to capitalize on them. Instead, the, the central 
messaging the Democrats have engaged in, not just in this current election cycle, but in the congressional election cycle two years ago, is about democracy and it's like it's possible and if the Republicans win. So there they have returned to this view for messaging's sake um, about the, the need for liberal essentials to be preserved as really the only important thing on the ballot. And I'm worried that at the, the messaging level, that's a mistake. One of the scariest things that was reported the other day was that one of Biden's central advisor, a man named Thomas Donilon, was quoted as saying, well, we know that the president is extremely unpopular right now, um, but we're not worried because when like Americans in large numbers begin to take the election seriously, they'll see that Trump's a threat to democracy and vote against him. Well, that's a huge bet. Uh, and it's not as if there aren't many months between now and then when Biden could come out or some successor, if he would step aside, to say, I'm going to restore liberalism and provide you with something appealing and credible. Um, and he did make a start, but those were baby steps relative to what the Democrats have been doing the last 50 years. And I wouldn't trust uh, necessarily someone who promises to change five minutes ago. Shin, do you have an online question? We do have a couple of questions online. And I think the first question actually um, sort of expands on the, the last question, on the question of domestic politics in the United States. Yeah. So the question is, is it liberalism's failure or conservatism's and libertarianism's success yeah. in mass channeling their message successfully to the people through yeah. false information Good. and dominating political debate with big spending? That's one question. Uh, the other question, uh, tying to your earlier slides about some of these public intellectuals debating Deneen, um, do you think that Fukuyama's end of history thesis has now been discredited beyond redemption? All right. So on, on the first question, um, it's certainly clear that uh, we can't think about the fate of liberalism in a void without thinking of the enemies of liberalism in motion and with their own strategies and tactics. Uh, so that's a really important point. What I worry about is that um, if we just focus on the hijinks of illiberals, we take the focus off what liberals would themselves need to do to beat their enemies electorally. Um, so I don't deny, I mean, there's been a huge emphasis in a lot of these discussions on the nature of conservatism, the, the trajectory of the Republican Party, and that's all fair. But much of it really has the, you know, the, the implicit or explicit moral that we just need to denounce the right a little more. Is the right winning because, uh, like, it's worth denouncing? or because it's it Trump you know moved first to recognize um, the toll of American militarism and neoliberalism in ways the Democrats were not initially willing to do. Um, that's, I think, worth asking. But I, I wouldn't for a moment deny the great importance of like pondering the success of illiberalism. Uh, which is uh, considerable historically and, and currently. All right, on the first thing, I, you know, I think we'd have to go back to Fukuyama's essay um, and read it carefully because I think a lot of people um, thought that it he was much more celebratory about the end of history than the actual essay, if you go back and read it in the national interest, um, suggests. Um, I do think um, he has been, you know, that there, there's been a lot of turbulence for Fukuyama's view in, in recent years. And I, I think it's, let's say the jury's out 
because we're not in the 1930s and we're not seeing the full scale overthrow of liberal democracy. Um, but we are seeing certain challenges where I think Fukuyama is, is more limited, is, is less than his original thesis than in how he thinks about what the liberalism was that won in 1989. Because if you go back and read the essay, um, there's not a lot of thought about different forms of liberalism and which kind actually was institutionalized, a kind of neoliberal one in 1989. And then correspondingly, when you look at his response to Trump in this book, Liberalism and His Discontents, he says, well, if only, you know, the left would, you know, you know, not talk so much about gay and transgender rights and, you know, uh, engage in woke politics on campus, the Democrats could win more. Seems implausible, but there's, there's, there's a lot of discourse to that effect. And, you know, th there's, there's good faith disagreement um, about so-called cultural issues and their relevance to, to the success of, of the right. But I'd still say, it's kind of astonishing if you read his book, uh, Liberalism and His Dis Discontents, how little he's read about the history of the very topic he's writing on. So that's 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 where I kind of draw a line because we're scholars here and we've read Mill and Tocqueville. Actually, given that we're a little short on time, maybe I'll take multiple questions. So, um, Zach and I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, thanks. I was just going to uh, invite you to talk a little more about foreign policy and okay. maybe do a science fiction. What would have happened if a more courageous, uh, more uh, credible foreign okay. policy uh, had emerged in the post-World War II era, what would the world look like? Right. What would that look like today uh, yeah. if, if we could do that? Hi, Professor. Thanks for being here. I want to ask if you could say a little bit more about what seems to me to be a political economic debate between neoliberalism and social democracy and this intellectual debate between core world liberalism and liberalism yep. 1.0. Um, it seems to me that these aren't necessarily the same things, but they dovetail quite strongly and pertinently in political terms right. as well. And I was wondering if the difference just a more economic focus or whether something more fundamental and generated at the originary okay. position. Okay, great. So on the first question, you know, let's just go back and and like concede that liberals live in a world of illiberal states and powers, and it's very hard to 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 advance liberalism as a cause on a global scale. One thing I talk about in the book is that notwithstanding their own imperialist mistakes, 19th century liberals actually wanted liberalism to be a global project. Um, whereas early Cold War liberals um, really were thinking that, you know, the Soviet Union was so scary that it might be best to, let's say, protect liberalism in its transatlantic homeland. Um, so I actually, you know, think the Cold War liberals in that early period were kind of less internationalist or global than one might insist. The trouble is that I think a lot of liberals since first in the later Cold War, the 1960s, especially uh, with the Vietnam War, and then after 1989, thought that liberalism could be pursued globally through war. Uh, and I just think the verdict on that strategy is clear, that it, it actually sets back the, the project that it's intended to, you know, advance. And so um, there's also a kind of economic component that since around the 1970s, where the liberals after, um, after World War II had at least thought about kind of um, the, the world is a collection of states, each of each of which should have some policy autonomy over kind of macroeconomic issues. In the neoliberal era, there's much less, and liberalism has really stood for for 
neoliberalism on a global scale through institutions like the uh, International Monetary Fund and World Bank. So on those two issues, militarism and neoliberalism, it seems like we could afford to, you know, to, to think of a liberal foreign policy beyond those crutches, acknowledging that it's not like uh, given the difficulty of advancing, you know, any ideology that it will just, you know, magically happen. Now, if I understood the question, it's a great one. And I, I just want to suggest that um, from the so-called new liberals, the, they called themselves this in the later 19th century to John Rawls, who's little more than a new liberal, I think, um, you know, basically adding more egalitarian and redistributive energy to liberalism. I think liberals became a little bit economistic and that's where I think they, they learn too much from Marxism. Uh, whereas the 19th century liberals understood liberalism to be, if you like, a spiritual project. Of course, Mill has his trajectory from being a little bit more, you know, mainstream, you know, classical liberal to being something close to, you know, a Bernie Sanders acolyte like me at the end of his life, he wrote, you know, about socialism. Um, but again, his, he thought, you know, the material circumstances like the institutional order of society more generally, that's just a foundation for this spiritual project of self-creation and making ourselves collectively and individually interesting that he cared most about. Nothing of that in Rawls uh, because Rawls privatizes the good life. Uh, so actually Deneen's right about Rawls that that liberals have given up on the idea of a highest life. Um, but uh, so, so I want to say that, of course, you know, we should have more egalitarianism and redistribution, but that's not the essence of what liberalism is. That's just an, a, a means to an end for liberals who care about this perfectionism that Mill and Tocqueville thought was the most important thing. Any other questions? Yes. If, if anybody has any other questions, put your hand up now and, and we can take it after, after his as well. So th these will be the last uh, two questions in that case. Um, I guess uh, I was wondering what you would think about the, if liberalism in, the U.S. is kind of if perhaps that experiment has has failed, and perhaps if you know looking at places like Poland, as you mentioned, if the heart of liberalism have, has moved back to continental Europe, um, what you think about that? My question might be slightly similar, which is, um, I loved how you talk about liberalism needs to think about what hope it can hold out to the world now and what has to reevaluate, keep, maybe change. So could you help us imagine a community that kind of is the end product of that reevaluation? Would something like Yale and US count, for example? Yes. Okay, so um, I really like that suggestion. I mean, I don't have a lot to say about it. I mean, uh, there's just been one election in Poland and it went the right way, but... Um, let's not get too ahead of ourselves, but, um, you know, it, 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 I don't think, you know, from my perspective, anyone has a proprietary relationship to liberalism. And indeed, as you say, one of my, uh, worries is that the cold war liberals, like, let's say, you know, anglicized liberalism, um, and associated it with England and sometimes with the United States, um, uh, and it's actually ought to be thought of as our common property as human beings. And that means we can adopt it wherever we happen to be situated. And in that sense, not everything is at stake. Uh, in 2024, you lose some elections. Uh, the trouble is just that the United States is so powerful that 
it matters to the liberal experiment everywhere what happens there, but not because liberals lose, they can win elsewhere, but because that election happens to be so consequential for what everyone else tries to do. But I really like your suggestion. I, I have a hard time. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, a Yale and US sounds pretty utopian to me, um, sitting around reading great books and, you know, the liberal arts, uh, where you, you know, commune with Mill and Tocqueville and set out inspired by them to live a creative life and not just for your own, you know, sake, but for the sake of collective learning and collective progress. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a shard of something that we could imagine generalized, um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I mean, there have been many attempts to establish such things, um, let's say, on a small scale. I mean, think of the communes that were set up, Brook Farm and other places in the American 19th century, really out of, you know, concerns, like romantic concerns, perfectionist, out of perfectionist ideals. Um, but, you know, on a large scale, I think we haven't haven't seen that. Um, and so the question for us would be, you know, even if a, a small scale experiment can fail or be shut down, that doesn't mean we can't, you know, cherish its legacy and save it and transport it and elevate it and generalize it uh, in, in wherever we go next and, and, and imagine a, a much larger scale, uh, you know, perfectionist politics. Great. Um, well, if if everybody could please uh, join me in thanking Professor Moyne for his talk and his answers to your questions. Um, we'll read some remarks by uh, Seder, student associate, and and that'll that'll be all for now. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and I hope that you've enjoyed the lecture. We would love to hear about your experience this evening. Please scan the QR code on the screen for your, uh, for the, uh, please scan the QR code for the, on the screen for the audience members here and click on the link um, in the chat box for our online audience. Um, we hope to uh, see, you here, uh, see you guys soon. Thank you. <laughs>